This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Uncontrolled. Instead of eye-for-eye eye punishment, there should be restitution to the victims, their families, or society. No revenge, such as the death penalty, will bring a murder victim back, nor will long-term imprisonment serve either justice or the protection of society. After all, prisons are only human trash cans for those that society has discarded as worthless. No sane and just society would adopt such a course. Society makes criminals and must be responsible for their treatment. White capitalist society is itself a crime and is the greatest teacher of corruption and violence. Lorenzo Comboa Irvin in his text, Anarchism and the Black Revolution. Anarchism has long seen the establishment of organized movement as a necessity for bringing about an anarchist society. Direct action and committed, sustained activism often manifest in organizations in order to have a critical cadre of bodies willing to put in the work for the movement's goals. As movement-oriented, or at least oriented toward understanding the importance of collectives and communes with substantive numbers to stave off political quashing, anarchism bears deep affinities to black, queer, and trans movements to bring about social justice. Surely there have been many demographics who have organized in order to change society, so movement orientation is not unique to black people. My point is that the black radical tradition has consistently rejected the seemingly stark divide between theory and practice, refusing the false assumption that one could s separate the articulation of ideas that would govern how we envision the future from actually enacting that future. Anarchism, too, has traditionally drawn upon ideas of coherence between theory and practice, which is to say that during theory, that doing theory is a critical praxis, that what we seek to engender in the world on a material level is itself a profound theoretical apparatus. Movement-oriented politics often orbit around the concept of domination. They also, though, orbit around conceptions of world-making and futurity, that is, not only the plights of the current moment, but also the world in which we envision ourselves after and in excess of the plight. Radical feminist, queer, and black liberationist movements from the Black Panther Party for self-defense to Black Lives Matter to street transvestite action revolutionaries, all because of their resistance to domination and imagining of radical futurity, bear affinities with anarchism. In line with the recalibrating work of the black anarchism expressed in this text, one might argue that black movements like Black Power and the BPP, or the Black Panthers Party, though at times, from their more Marxist-Leninist perspectives, critical of anarchism proper, are anarchic despite not having been affiliated with anarchism precisely because, quote, black anarchism did not originate within anarchism but external to it, end quote. The Black Panther, the Black anarchism of, say, the Black Panthers is one in which they blended anarchist positions with their revolutionary nationalism, though there is a distinction to be made. Black anarchists do not hold on to a nationalist conception of an exclusionary bordered state as Marxist Leninist Black, Black Panthers do. Nationalism should be understood as anathema to anarchist sentiments, and the Black anarchism of someone like Kwasi Balagoon seeks to get rid of borders. Quote, it seems to me that anarchy would have to be anti-imperialist, that, that there's no other ideology that refuses to recognize borders, he says in July 28, 1984 letter from prison. The link between anarchism and black power slash the Black Panthers is given more strength by that fact that many of the key figures in expressed black anarchism, Ashanti Alston, Kwasi Balagoon, Lerzo Kamboa Irvin, Ohore Lutalo were members of the Panthers. Although it is crucial to note that these thinkers and activists and organizations they were a part of do not necessarily possess the right quote unquote conception of black anarchism they can be they can be thought of as instances of the work blackness does to anarchism this concluding chapter takes aim at movement goals such as abolition and tending to the material needs of the most marginalized to round out what anarcho blackness can and has looked like as i think explicitly about abolition i'm using 
as its definition, simply the political strategy of eradicating rather than reforming systems, discourses, and institutions that structure life and livability. These systems, an example, prisons, the gender binary, etc., have at their foundation ongoing violence that masquerades as banal or worse, natural and good. Abolition then promotes a dismantling of these systems in search of life and livability by other means not predicated on violence. In meditating on abolition's relationship to anarchism, star, uh, and thinking like an anarchist, I want to highlight the beautifully sporadic embrace of free association, direct participation, and radical democracy, what might also be termed non-hierarchical relationality. The emphasis on consent rather than coercion and on self and communal governance or a conception of organization, the advancement of direct action, the advocacy for the dismantling of all hierarchies and express global solidarity with all who are oppressed and subject to hierarchical tyranny. In short, movements for black and queer and trans liberation are indeed radical movements inspired by tenets of anarchist tradition often demonized by state and corporate power. Quote, prison, a social protection, what a monstrous mind ever conceived of such an idea. Just as well say that health can be promoted by widespread contagion or contagions. End quote. Emma Goldman in her text, Prisons, a Social Crime and Failure. The undercurrent of many contemporary and even some not so contemporary social justice movements that carry out the black radical tradition is a marked abolitionism. Kropotkin, the poster boy of classical anarchism, himself expressed a clear desire to end imprisonment, condemning carcerality's dehumanizing tendencies, advocating for education programs for the formerly incarcerated, and firmly supporting the reintroduction of prison populations into general society. In a nutshell, our boy Peter was an abolitionist. Abolitionism, I want to argue, is fundamentally anarchic, not because avowed anarchists argue for abolition in name, but because abolitionism, with its complete extrication from the state, from racial and gender capitalism, and from carcerality, mobilizes the anarcho I have argued for throughout this text. The prefixal anarcho describes a world-making, a creative, imaginative praxis reliant upon a pervasive un that erects as much even more than it destroys. Agreeing that abolitionism is an anarchic modality brings to force an unaddressed blackness in anarchism inasmuch as it takes plain the historical proximity of blackness to abolitionism and thus anarchism. It forces a recognition of capitalism's exploitative and extricative relationship to free labor that bears a striking resemblance to the extricative and exploitative relationship of anti-black sociality to blackness and black subjects. Abolitionism is a visionary and political praxis and modality that struggles against the regimes of capitalism, white supremacy, heteronormative patriarchy, and cis sexism. It is a daring rooted in a black liberatory history of maroons, black proto-anarchists, one might say, quote, who are dared to imagine their lives without shackles, end quote. The desire to deshackle from any and all fetters imagines one's being in the world as anarchic. No gods, no masters, the old saying goes. To deshackle oneself marks a radical act of freedom in the broadest sense, a way of living not in defiance, but in refusal and subversion of the state. It is imperative and alluded to in previous chapters to understand the state not merely as an institutional entity, it is a relation and more the state manifests in an underlying logic of carcerality, which is to say the bedrock ground for intelligibility and at more fundamental level reality. Logic as the very grammar by which things are expressible and understandable and indeed possible. This forces many social relations to depend on various mechanisms of confinement, punishment, capture, or circumscription. Anarchism is a deshackling from capitalism and the state and its attending conscripts. Anarchism is a kind of abolitionism. 
Like Dylan Rodriguez, I would argue that abolitionism is inseparable from its roots in feminist queer black liberation. Black liberation's queer and feminist fundament is clarified in abolition's departure from the tenets of white and cis male supremacy as they uphold capitalism and carcerality. Logics of carcerality, by which I mean the penchant to proliferate capture and expropriation along racist and sexist axes, are embedded in racism and sexism via assumed ownership over racialized and or non-masculine gendered subjects. Conscription of who is permitted to appear in public space, regulation of movement and habitation of private space, and extrication of surplus goods and resources, be it labor, sex, sexual labor, time, etc. In short, again, following Rodriguez, abolition intervenes in a patriarchal and masculinist constructions of freedom, self-determination, and obliterates liberal optimistic paradigms of incrementalist reformist social justice. Abolition in its radical totality consists of constant critical assessment of the economic, ecological, political, cultural, and spiritual conditions for the security and liberation of subjected people's fullest collective being and posits that revolutions of material, economic, and political systems compose the necessary but not definitive or completed conditions for abolitionist praxis. Substituting anarchism for abolition might yield nearly the exact same outcomes. Having parsed the connection between anarchism and abolitionism and conveyed the links of abolitionism to queer and feminist blackness, it is plain that there is a justifiable relation between anarchism and queer and feminist blackness. The utility in teasing, albeit briefly, this relation is to provide a foundation for this chapter's emphasis on social movements and organizations. The people and organizations I would detail below have as their basis abolition broadly conceived. They delineate abolition as a more than mere negation. Abolition is charactered as radically imaginative and generative, creative and world building. Again, Bakunin's anarchism rears here. The passion for destruction is a creative passion, too. Abolitionism is a radical, anti-state, socially productive, communal, and community building practice. It is, as Jerry Gordon details, politically prefigurative. It means... Uh, its means are consistent with its ends, performing the kinds of politics and worlds it seeks for its ends. The shared commitments and abolitionism and anarchism are often cast as unrealistic, too radical, or pipe dreamy, but the castigations of realism and reform and measure are in, actually, in actuality rhetorical gestures to preserve hegemony. Indeed, Quote, abolitionist politics is not about what is possible, but about making the impossible a reality, end quote, as abolition writes in their manifesto. Of course, it is assumed that by those proponents of realism that we must have at least some people who are incarcerated. Of course, we must punish people who do egregious things, a world without punishment as the operative measure being a ridiculous one. Abolitionism and anarchism reject that. Of course. The ungovernable anarchic here and now harbors black futures. Kara Keeling in her text or their text, Queer Times Black Futures. We are already doing anarchist politics now, living in our coalitions and communes that go by different names. Those ways of relating to one another on different anarchic grounds is the way we live now, the black anarchism we shuffle toward, those black futures uh, Kara Keeling finds harbored in the ungovernable and anarchic. There are people who have lived and are living this life. I find some of those people in the street transvestite action revolutionaries, or star, precisely because it is foregrounded Black and brown, not black and brown queer trans live as an anarchic practice. I find some of these people in the long tradition of black organizations doing anarchic work. Hence, in this section, I want to 
hone in on the movement politics of star and the longer durée of black people doing and thinking anarchic shit as examples of how feminist movements that center black and queer uh, and trans black queer and trans people display anarchic valences and tendencies indeed how these organizations and people retool what anarchism mean and how it might circulate mid 20th century is when left politics really intensified Opposition to the Vietnam War and civil rights and black power and gay liberation and women's liberation all converged in the 1960s and 70s to create an ethos of radicalism. They put forth a profound sentiment that things needed to change while they all expressed the need for change differently, emphasizing different aspects of social life and expressing disdain at times for the emphases of other movements. They all nonetheless coalesced into a prevailing atmosphere of leftist radicalism and a departure from the status quo. A general sense of anti-authoritarianism characterized by this quote-unquote new left, members of the Gay Liberation Front collaborated with the young lords who collaborated with black panthers there's a certain liberatory logic that pervades these organizations and while that logic was muted and intensified in different intensified in different ways manifesting in some sexual liberation organizations being racist and some racial liberation movements being sexist they all nonetheless are implementing anarchic inflections i contend the anti the anti authoritarian spirit, albeit unevenly realized and by no means universal, demanded full liberation for all oppressed communities, and these communi- and and these liberation and leftist politics had as their aim the toppling of white supremacy's racist power structure, as the Black Panthers were fond of terming it, and abolishing the oppressive institutions that reinforced traditional sex roles and freeing individuals from the constraints of a sex slash gender system that lock them into mutually exclusive rules of homosexual, heterosexual, and feminine masculine. This coalitional drive navigates through the apogee of anarcho as it promise or as it's promiscuous and politically driven coming together rested on a common desire to topple the state. And in this radically rewound and remixed blackness that concretizes Ashanti Alston's inquiries, how can we bring all these different strands together? How can we bring in the Rastas? How can we bring in the people on the West Coast who are still fighting the government strip mining of indigenous land? How can we bring together all of these people to begin to create a vision of America that is for all of us. Oppositional thinking and oppositional risks are necessary. I think it is very important right now and one of the reasons why I think anarchism has so much potential to help us move forward. It is not asking of us to dogmatically adhere to the founders of the tradition, but to be open to whatever increases our democratic participation, our creativity, and our happiness. And at this effort to bring together, to organize and be with one another in anarchic assemblages that aim to bring down racial and gender capitalism is, as the title of the source of the above quote illuminates brilliantly, Ashanti Alston's Black Anarchism. The politics of that era, with its increasing radicalism and deviation from state imperatives, mirrored very closely the kind of politics found in avowed anarchist organizations prior to the start of the Vietnam War. In this vein, mid-20th century's eruptive counterculture of the new left might be described as not implausibly as the new anarchism and as anarchist in its deepest impulses. The street transvestite action revolutionaries was formed by Silvia Rivera, Sylvia Rivera, a Latinx dra- trans drag queen, and Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans drag queen. Rivera and Johnson started Star after feelings of estrangement with Gay Liberation Fr- uh, Front, or GLF, and the Gay Activist Alliance, or GAA. Both GLF and GAA were not radical enough for Rivera and Johnson, in part because of their refusal to combat the police and their lack of militancy with respect to the needs of those who are both called poor street queens or impoverished queer and trans houseless sex workers in a contemporary lexicon. 
Following the Stonewall Rebellions of June 1969, Rivera joined gay rights organizations only to be treated hostilely with trans antagonism and racism. These organizations very often willingly replicated exclusionary nationalist notions of good citizenship, valorizing the criteria of the state. Importantly, such a statist outlook with respect to Rivera took the form of deploring her rude anarchism as inim inimical to order. Rivera was uncompromising in her quest to help the most marginalized. She could not abide order or exclusion. Her politics and orientations toward life always move to include, not exclude, to increase participation in decisions that mattered, not decrease it. Star, or Star House, became a shelter of sorts for houseless youth, impoverished people of color, street queens, and others seeking community with people who have also been marginalized. Rivera and Johnson resisted assimilation into mainstream gay organizations that mimicked state operations of nation building, exclusion, hierarchy, and normativity, not to mention implicit white supremacy and cis normativity. Beyond a basic commitment to survival, Star could be primarily categorized or characterized by defiance. Star and its members were defiant as they opposed numerous systems and discourses that sought to police and discipline them as poor, as of color, as queer, as trans, as queens, and as sex workers. It is the fundamental operation of the state and racial slash gender capitalism to impose rigidity and order onto sociality, quelling movement that deviates from the tenets they inscribe. The violent normativity, which is to say normativity as such, of centralized and privatized atmospheric control that regulates sociality, expunges non-adherence to purported birth sex or the gender binary. Sex uh, assignation and demarcation within the gender binary is inherent to and compulsory under the state. Thus, Starr's opposition to the state manifested deeply in their expressions of transness. Put differently, sufficient anarchism necessitates a trans relation to the state. As well, Starr expressly demonstrated the pervasiveness of mutual caregiving in trans communities among trans and non-binary people, sharing not only food but tips for survival, ways to move throughout the city, and methods to navigate the terrain of their identities. Rivera and Johnson practiced anarchism in excess of the name. They practiced the propelling anarcho bringing to bear on their caregiving the importance of radicalized and gendered, specifically trans and non-binary, subjectivity. The Star House Kids, as Rivera and Johnson's mentees were called, were gifted Rivera and Johnson's love. Their primary goal was to help kids on the street find food, clothing, and a place to live, along with eventually establishing a school for kids who'd never learned to read and write because their formal education was interrupted because of discrimination and bullying. This is nothing but anarchic love. This is what anarcho looks like, irrespective of political affiliation. Starr wanted something akin to anarchism, or they lived and moved through the world propelled by the anarcho. As a concluding testament, we might turn to the ninth point in the list of demands that Starr published in 1971. It reads, quote, We want a revolutionary people's government where transvestites, street people, women, homosexuals, Puerto Ricans, Indians, and all oppressed people are free and not fucked over by this government who treat us like the scum of the earth and kill us off like flies, one by one, and throw us into jail to rot. End quote. What they envisioned from the experiential and social modality of their transness, their queerness, their blackness, and their Latinxness was a different kind of government. Surely an anarchist might question the yearning for any government at all as governments operate through the means and intentions of the state. It could be argued, however, that Starr's vision is not governmental in the sense that a revolutionary people's government is a radically re-understood approach to governance that bears few, if any, of the filigree and organs of a government in the traditional sense. 
for houseless, trans, gay, and otherwise oppressed people of color to be free, in fact, necessitates the tearing down of government. Thus, the revolutionary people's government is no government at all. It is, in a slant and perhaps admittedly insufficient way, anarchist society. Re- revolutionary people's government with its an with its attention to the most marginalized and care work for oppressed people is a proto non-governmental government, one in which the organization of care, aid, participation, and non-authority is named under the nominative revolutionary people's government. Starr is making a key distinction between this government, the one that fucks people over and treats them like scum, and a different kind of government, which might simply be an organizational method or characterization of the modes of life that arise in the jettisoning of this government. This government is the state. Revolutionary people's government is anarchism. It is anarchy. In an anarchist society, writes Lorenzo Comboa Irvin, prisons would be done away with, along with courts and police, and replaced by with community-run programs and centers interested solely with human regeneration and social training, rather than custodial supervision in an inhuman lockup. This eradication of prisons need not be one and done gesture that is the raising of all prisons in one fell swoop. Abolition, to be sure, is not interested in mere reform and holds no con- and holds in contempt those who seek modest proposals such as having some prisons for the really bad apples. Abolition is not about that life. At the same time, it is acknowledged that there are steps toward abolition There are, in other words, things to be done between now and the dismantling of all prisons, and the things done in the interim may not have the look of complete abolition, but are nonetheless in service of that end. In other words, I want to shy ever so modestly away from the political purity as a requisite for affiliation. Anarchism, I want to maintain, holds the capacity for capitulations without denigrating such efforts as characteristic of a person's or organization's entire enterprise. In our particular moment, then, black anarchism can be found or sometimes glimpsed in movements like that of BLM or anarchist people of color or critical resistance or the Audre Lorde Project and in a range of other formal and informal groupings. The point I want to make is twofold, that organizations catering specifically to and arising from people who experiences the forces surrounding blackness are doing anarchic work without needing to affix the label to their mastheads. They are organizations that center blackness that, because by virtue of centering blackness, politicize themselves anarchically. If if they are centering blackness as larger radical movements, they are given the opportunity to think like like anarchists, to think like an anarchist is the aim rather than to hunker down in an ontolo- ontologized being that one considers politically sufficient, to think like an anarchist and thus to come into performative way of being or into performative being by way of such thinking is the propulsion of the anarcho. Second, there is already, implicitly, anarchist work being done by people and movements that center blackness, work that does not concede to a parochial, narrowly identitarian or ontological understanding of the black and their black anarchism. For these groups and individuals, blackness is a demand, a critical modality, one in which a racialized situatedness inflects a broader concern about forces and taxonomy uh, and how to subvert them for racialized ontologies imposed from without are a prominent form of taxonomizing the indexes, the more central concern of subverting taxonomizing gestures writ large taxonomizing gestures that might be described, in other words, as authority. The paths forward are many. To get anywhere, though, I think they will require that we understand, cultivate, and nurture the inherent rhizomatic 
anarcho within blackness and blackness within the anarcho. Intentionally and explicitly, as blackness has historically thought political concretization, there have been many false starts and dead ends, however beautiful, however much they have taught us from hierarchical forms of Marxist-Leninism and Maoism in the 1960s and 70s, to various strategies of compromise and co-optation that have led to today's failed attempts to seize the anarchic vastness of blackness into the straitjacket of the Democratic Party, and partisan political shuffling in general. But as with the shortcomings of classical anarchism, let's not waste time with condemnation, with detailing the failings of those who came before. The swinging door of blackness is accommodating and generous. It has no bouncer and it looks to the future without wallowing in the past or present missteps of potential allies, let alone siblings in the struggle. Comrades, to meet that future, I am saying that we must allow ourselves to be permeated by the anarcho. What this look like? Well, no one can say. But then, what can we say? Blackness demands abolition. Anarchism is abolition. The reality has always been hidden right where we can see it. If we look from the right angle, if we do the work to tease it out. But what might it look like if we did more than tease? What would it look like if we actually build with the destructive abolitionist material of anarcho-blackness? One hesitates to offer blueprints for something that cannot be restrained. So let's consider some impressions, unhinged and uncontrolled flights of fancy. Let's consider... An anarcho-blackness manifesto we must not prescribe, for prescriptions skew too rigidly, too masterfully. Anarcho-blackness does not seek rigidity and definitiveness, even in its definitional folds. It prefers instead an openness to possibilities. It prefers what ifs, perhapses, possibles, uh, and maybes. Too many to name, but as a start. What if anarcho-blackness moved toward radical self-determination whereby we become to ourselves and to others precisely what affirms our subjectivity, allowing us to live in this moment unhindered by given scripts? This is a self-determination unconcerned with individuated identity, discrete and singular. It is rather the ethical comportment toward proliferating unrecognized forms of life. That is our aim. We seek to allow others and non-persons and unpeople and impossible people and no ones and those of us living by normative subjectivities because we believed they, they were all we had to live. What we are cannot be fixed. We are becoming or Perhaps the scribbles on the perforated leaflets of black anarchism invite not rights, which will continually have us beholden to a state's apparatus, but ethics, modalities of inter and intra relation. We must encourage different ways of being together, opening our homes to those who need them without charging rent, opening the park or the rooftops to those who wish to sleep outdoors under the stars without being disturbed, opening the abandoned houses down the way where squatters become instead stewards of space because it's now their home all because what it means to be a society a commune a swarm a togetherness is to live in the groove of the anarcho needing nothing but wanting to share answering to no one but responding to all our sociality needs no permission and we express it in defiance of all laws of property and propriety for the still How might it possibly benefit our world if there was a medical treatment on demand, treatments that span the common cold to gender confirmation surgeries to therapy? And we must note the abrupt cessation of medical treatments that coercively alter intersex newborn genitals and the cessation of psychological evaluations for gender transition, the cessation, too, of medical juridical state regulated requirements for identity document changes, the cessation of public and private regulation of appearance, of social comportment, of neurotypicality, of sartorial sartorial expression. Our bodies, minds, desires refuse state or any other regulation. And maybe 
it is imperative for us to demand free education for all, no educational resources withheld based on zip code, nor more disciplinary pedagogical habits, inclusive of all things from metal detectors to grades. No child, teen, or adult will go to school hungry. We educate for freedom as freedom and abolish the police, abolish persons, abolish the gender binary, full stop. We offer dances of thought, possibilities for how you who hold this text in your hands and those who your hands guide and nurture and build with might go out into the world you find in and begin or continue to manifest the fact that we are not yet broken. We are not subdued at the present time and we are still loving others, loving ourselves, loving those who may yet may not yet be able to appear and yes loving those who have orchestrated this mess it is a multifaceted love caressing some while slapping the shit out of others we want you yes you are you listening we want you to demand better by planting a garden and calling out white supremacist patriarchal cis hetero heteropatriarchy demand better by asking comrades and accomplices you good and punching nazis Nazis demand better by opening the door for the many and non-gendered kinfolk who you've just met for the first time and literally stealing from universities and jails and corporations. Do what you can. Do all you can where you're where you are, where you are right now and wherever else you might end up. And that was Anarcho Blackness. Notes toward a black anarchism by Marquise Bay. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.